I think the last time that I stood in front of a group, I know a lot of you, I don't know all of you, but a group and look out like this, members of the church, was on my wedding day. <laughs> and my best friend, who was in the Air Force with me, we were standing there looking out, and he leaned over to me, he said, I think we better get out of here before they start chunking rocks at us. Uh, I just wanted to open with a little bit of levity, and I'm going to beat up on Mike. He asked me uh, to talk about my conversion, and I asked him the other day when I realized it was this morning's uh, session, I said, do you need a bio on me? No, you're only going to be up there a couple minutes. <laughs> so I'm asking you not to open your Bibles. <clears throat> I'm asking you to listen to the words. Psalms 139 is my favorite, and when I think anything about God and about Jesus, I have to go back and think about what we are supposed to do and how mighty God is in our lives. So I'm going to start with Psalms 139, and hopefully when I finish, I will finish with Psalms 138. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed on the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. And this is what I like about David. This is Tom Toy and David together. If only you would slay the wicked, O God, away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not... Hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I have to read that. I won't say every day of, of my life, but when I pick up my Bible, that's the first thing I turn to, to read, because it puts me in place. Now, I'm supposed to be telling you about my conversion. So I'll tell you where my place was. I was born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm a Yankee. And much to Ronnie Clark's chagrin, I'm an Eagles fan. I still have my season tickets. But I want you to imagine this. Where I was raised is just like Marshall, as far as the trees, the hardwoods, the pines, the flowers, the bushes, the grass. I was used to all of that. It was second nature to me. I never really thought about it and, and thank God for it because it, I just accepted it the way that it was. And if you can't imagine at 19 years of age 
going to Big Spring, Texas. <laughs> and I flew in on an airplane, and when you looked out the window and you looked down, all you saw was brown. And I didn't understand it. I didn't know a place like that existed. And I thought to myself, now I was not a godly person. I was not a Christian by any means. And I thought, God, what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> well, needless to say, after I was there a year and a half or so, I met a woman. And I say that because prior to that, guys, we all dated girls. But this was the first time that I had really met a woman. And I knew from the day that I met her that that was somebody that I wanted to have close to me for the rest of my life. Amen. Melva is... Uh, she has, her parents were members of the Church of Christ. Her father was an elder in the church, very quietly spoken, didn't say much. But I think the reason that he didn't say too awful much was because I was in the Air Force, I was a Yankee, and I was dating his daughter. Uh, he never said anything bad to me, he just never spoke that much. <laughs> but Melva and I dated, and, and about six months later, I asked her to marry me. Well, she wouldn't answer. Okay, now in that six months' time of dating her, I went to church with her. And one of the, the important things was that people there at the church accepted me. They didn't, they teased me about being a Yankee because it, it didn't bother me. I was, I, would, I was proud of it, okay, if you can understand that. But when we would go to Bible class and, the, and the, the guy that was teaching the classes would say something and I'd have a question and he didn't tell me what his opinion was and I wasn't used to that. When I had gone to church before up in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, you ask a question, you got an opinion. And here was a man that opened his Bible and said, let's see what the Bible says about that. I'm not going to tell you what I think of this. I'm going to let the Bible tell you what God thinks of this. And that was a start for me. Well, this is back in 1965. Actually, 64 when I met Melba. We got married, and a week before we were to be married, I got orders to go overseas. And in 65, if you remember, that was Vietnam. Yep. Okay, I did not go directly to Vietnam. I went to the Philippines. But it was a 15-month tour. Now, we had only been married for four months when I went overseas and came back 15 months later. And we picked up, we went to Sherman, Texas, and we went to the church there, and there was a man there by the name of Joy Lee Brazel. Big guy. I don't know of any of you, whether you know him or not, he's passed away. Uh, but he baptized me there. And the, the part of it that I always worry about or wonder about was, and I don't know how many of you, but I was baptized because of fear. You know, if, if something happened, and I had orders to go back overseas again for the second time. And he, he showed me all the things in the Bible, told me all about the Bible, but his emphasis was on fear. If something happens to you over there and you're not baptized, you're going to hell. And of course, Melba was there, and we were, you know, we would be talking and whatever. So I decided to be baptized, and I was. But you know what? I was not really a Christian. 
I, I didn't do the things that Christian. Okay, I'm baptized. Fine. I, now I'm saved. I don't have to worry about going to hell if, if uh, something happens to me while I'm overseas. When I came back and then finally we got out of the Air Force and we moved back to Pennsylvania, we went to church at Westchester Church of Christ in Pennsylvania. Now, I don't know whether many of you know about Camp Manitoni. Does anybody know about Manitoni? Okay. There was an elder there. His name was Don Garrett. And he was a powerful man. And he taught me that I needed to be doing more things for Christ. I needed to be working in his vineyard. This is the Northeast. Churches were 20, 30 miles apart. It's not like in Marshall where you got one on every corner or in Dallas. It's not like that up there. It's hard work and you have to be willing to give your life to Christ. And Don Garrett taught me that. He taught me something else too. He taught me love. He taught me the love of Christ because that's what he was doing. That's the way he was working was through the love of Christ, not because he feared for his salvation. We moved to New Jersey. We ended up spending 45 years in the Pittman Church of Christ in New Jersey. Met another man there, his name is Frank Rizzuto. Another man who loved the Lord. And these men inspired me. They were older, but they reached out to a young man. And I'm encouraging each one of us here that as we go back to our congregations and wherever, that we talk to our young men. Talk to the young family men. Encourage them. Teach them about the love of Jesus. Teach them that they need to be teachers. They need to be teaching Bible classes. That is how I learned about the love of Christ. By reading. And by studying to teach a class. What did I know about teaching? Not a thing. I drove trucks. That's what I did. But the responsibility was on me. I placed that responsibility on me that I needed to know more. And by me teaching, I learned more than I could teach to anybody else. Amen. We need to be teaching our younger men so that they can be leaders in the church. They will be the future deacons. They will be the future elders. We won't always be there. There's a lot of men that I have known and, and I grew up with. They took me under their wing and taught me. And I thank God for each one of those men. I don't want this to sound the wrong way. Uh, there are young boys at our church in Pittman that I took a special interest in. And now those young men, I look back on them and they are succeeding. Not because of me, but because of the love of God and the love that was shown to them when they went to church. That people cared, that we reached into our hearts, and that we gave them our love and the love of Jesus for them to understand and to grow with. It's, it's uh, difficult. It's not easy. One of the things that's, that's happened through my, I'll use the word conversion, I don't like it because it's not done yet. I'm not converted yet. Christ is still working in my life, Amen. still teaching me things, mm -hmm. teaching me to accept people as he accepted people. Our congregation in New Jersey was 40% African American. When we first started going there, I had just gotten out of the service. I wasn't too awful sure about that. I, I just was not awful sure about it. And today I will say that we have numerous friends, and I don't want to sit here, but almost everybody in that congregation is a close friend. We've been to their house. They've been to our house. We have fellowship together. We've gone out to dinner together. We've gone on trips together. We need...
to bring the love of Christ to everybody. We need to learn to accept everybody because, think about it, we're asking them to accept us as we are. We need to accept them as they are. They have different thoughts. They have different priorities. But our priority first is Jesus and his life. Um, I think I will end with that, except that I do want to read Psalms 138. And I especially would like for you to listen. It's v- the, verse 8 is the, is the one that really gets me in this. Psalms 138. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. When I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is on high, he looks upon the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. And this is what gets me about this psalm. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. That's David asking God not to abandon him. And we need to do that every day of our lives.